Welcome to AstroCast.TV, your source for news and information about astronomy and our solar system. Now, here is your host, NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, Greg Redfern. It's episode six, and we're off to low Earth orbit and the upcoming Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission, where I'll be talking with Edward O. Rootberg, the Deputy Program Manager for the HSD program at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Welcome to AstroCast.TV. If you're watching us on YouTube or through an RSS feed, be sure to visit our website at www.astrocast.tv where you can see past episodes and ask us an astronomy question. Also in this episode, AstroCast.tv's Katie Moore from the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. will give us a night sky update for the month of September. The Hubble Space Telescope, or HST for short, just completed its 100,000th orbit around our planet last month. For you trivia lovers, that equates to 2.7 billion, that's with a B, miles or 5,700 round trips to the moon in 18 years. Obviously, all that time and mileage adds up to wear and tear on HST, so the People's Telescope is going to get a service call from astronauts in October. This will be the fifth and final mission to HST and is designated Servicing Mission 4 or SM4. Following the 2003 Columbia accident, NASA originally canceled further HST servicing missions. But the outcry from scientists and the public made NASA rethink its position and the go-ahead for SM4 became a reality. STS-125 is due to launch October 8th aboard Space Shuttle Atlantis for the 11-day and 5 spacewalk mission. Without the International Space Station as a lifeboat for Atlantis, NASA will have Space Shuttle Endeavor ready for a rescue mission. The seven astronauts aboard Atlantis will carry enough food and supplies for 25 days, and if required, Endeavor will perform the rescue mission and return to Earth with 11 astronauts, three more than the previous record of eight. SM4 has three main objectives. As detailed by NASA, the first objective is to extend Hubble's operational life by at least five years. Astronauts will replace all six gyroscopes, install new batteries, and exchange a degraded fine guidance sensor with a new one. They will also install replacement thermal insulation on critical component bays of the telescope and add a mechanism that will aid in Hubble's final deorbiting. The second objective is to enhance Hubble's scientific capabilities by having astronauts install two new instruments, the Wide Field Camera 3 and the Cosmic Origin Spectrograph. The camera, which sees invisible, infrared, and ultraviolet light, will improve Hubble's ability to see further into space because of improvements in technology and design that have occurred since the last instruments were installed. Hubble's new spectrograph will improve Hubble's ability to tenfold detect an object's spectral characteristics. Spectrographs are instruments that break light into component colors, revealing information such as temperature and composition about the object emitting the light. The new spectrograph will see ultraviolet light, which is particularly important because most of the ultraviolet light from space is absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere, making ground-based telescope observations impossible at this wavelength. The third and final objective is to repair Hubble's out-of-commission instruments, the Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph and the Advanced Camera for Surveys. The imaging spectrograph stopped working in 2004 and the Advanced Camera failed in 2007. Both of these instruments have been widely used by scientists and the astronauts will have to open them to repair them, a first in spaceflight history. In previous servicing missions, instruments and components were sw simply swapped out. For more details on Hubble's final servicing mission, let me introduce Edward O. Rootberg, the Deputy Program Manager for the HST program at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Edward. What makes SM4 different from previous Hubble servicing missions? Well, I think the thing that's different is that we're going to be installing uh, two new instruments on this mission. We'll be repairing uh, two uh, instruments on board the telescope uh, to give us a whole new suite of instrumentation on, uh, on the telescope that will provide uh, the most powerful imaging ever um, and also provide a full set of tools for astrophysics. So I think when we end up this mission, we are going to have the most uh, powerful telescope. NASA has announced the shuttle Endeavour will be rolled out with SM4 shuttle Atlantis. Is this because you're flying a more dangerous mission or just as a safety precaution? 
It's a safety precaution. Uh, we're uh, working to make this uh, mission uh, safe as any mission we've flown before. Uh, we've done four uh, servicing missions successfully, and uh, we're taking the same precautions, if not more, for this mission. Edward Rupert from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Following successful completion of SM-4, Hubble will be left in the best shape ever and will continue to probe the depths of the universe for all to see well into the next decade. Moving from HST back to Earth, I recently attended the 2008 Almost Heaven Star Party in Spruce Knob, West Virginia. Close to 200 stargazers, many with their telescopes and camping gear, spent three days and nights at the annual AHSP gathering hosted by the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club, better known as NOVAC. Informational talks, including two by yours truly, field trips, and of course, stargazing was enjoyed by all. Now, for more on our night sky, here's Katie Moore from the National Air and Space Museum. She's here to tell us what's up for the month of September. Thanks, Greg. As summer winds down in the northern hemisphere, the summer triangle puts on a show. Once it gets dark outside, about an hour after sunset, you'll notice three bright stars straight overhead that mark the corners of the summer triangle. The brightest star in the summer triangle is named Vega, and the others on the eastern side of the triangle are Deneb and Altair. The summer triangle is an asterism, an informal sky picture, not an official constellation. In fact, its three bright stars are in three different constellations called Lyra, Cygnus, and Aquila. Vega is the fifth brightest star in the night sky, and it's in the constellation of Lyra. Lyra is a lyre, which is a musical instrument like a little harp. Look for a tiny parallelogram of four stars that form the outside of the harp, and imagine that the strings are strung between them next to the jewel of Vega. Altair is one of the closest stars to our solar system, a little over 16 light years away, which is why it appears as one of the brightest stars in the sky. It is a white star burning hotter than our sun in a constellation that looks like an eagle called Aquila. Altair and the stars on each side of it are the eagle's head, and dimmer stars to the sides mark the eagle's wings, spread wide in flight. To finish the summer triangle, we come to the star Deneb in the constellation Cygnus, which is sometimes nicknamed the Northern Cross. Cygnus is a swan, and Deneb marks its tail. The star Alberia sits at the end of the swan's long neck. The swan's wings are off to the sides. Alberia shows itself as a gorgeous double star in, a, in large binoculars or a small telescope. Next month, we will take a closer look at Cygnus. Now, back to Greg Redfern. Thanks, Katie. In other news, Mars Phoenix Lander took the first ever image of a single Martian dust particle using its onboard atomic force microscope. Only a millionth of a meter across, this dust particle is the same as the dust that covers Mars and gives the planet its distinct color. According to the European Space Agency, the heads of the International Space Station agencies from Canada, Europe, Japan, Russia, and the United States met at ESA headquarters in Paris, France in July to review ISS cooperation. The ISS now provides for on-orbit research and technology development activities and as an engineering testbed for flight systems and operations critical to future space exploration initiatives. These activities improve the quality of life on Earth by expanding the frontiers of human knowledge. That's all the time we have for this episode. Remember to visit us at www.astrocat.tv where you can ask our science advisor, Dr. Harold Geller, an astronomy question. For all of us here at astrocat.tv, I'm Greg Redfern. Tune in next time as we learn more about the wonders and mysteries of the universe in which we live and explore.